Every school in Oakland will be a charter. So before I left, I had a meeting with Jerry. I said, Jerry, before you turn them all into charters, why don't you look at the charters you have? Because they're all bad. <laughs> Terrible. But Jerry didn't want to hear it, because he had in his mind that charters was the answer. And so despite the evidence, that's where he was headed. And that's what we find too often in the name of policymaking around education, is that despite the evidence, we fixate on one strategy. Right now, the strategy is standards. Standards and assessment. That'll fix it. And we still aren't getting at the substance. The substance of education. My colleague, a friend at uh, the University of Wisconsin, who's a faculty member there, also a professor, says he compares testing the kids to weighing cattle. Right? Weighing cattle for slaughter. He says that the, every farmer knows that cows don't get fatter by weighing them. Right? <laughs> and the kids don't get smarter by testing them. Right? That is, if we're not focused on how do we provide high-quality instruction, how do we create conditions in schools where more kids can learn, how do we alter the environment in schools so there's greater engagement, so that we don't have people who are clearly unable to do the job in front of the kids? If we're not talking about that, then how serious is this conversation? We know, for example, that there are lots and lots of kids who come to school every day hungry, who can't take a test because they need eyeglasses and can't see it. I was talking to the principal of the second largest high school in the country, 5,300 kids at Roosevelt High School in Los Angeles. And I was asking, how are you coping with the test? He said, well, just before the test recently, I asked my teachers to just eyeball the students and see if they could identify kids who couldn't take the test because they couldn't see, whose faces were planted on the desk because they couldn't look at, read the paper. He said, that day we identified 68 kids who needed eyeglasses. If we're not talking about addressing those needs, the health, safety, counseling needs of kids, then what we're doing is we're asking schools to solve problems that no school can solve. Schools cannot address issues of poverty on their own. What Rod Page was calling for, the letter he signed, was calling for a comprehensive urban policy that addresses education in concert with health care, in concert with housing. Because we can't ask schools to be the only institution that serves the needs of poor kids by themselves. But that's precisely what we've done. And then we blame the schools for failing. Those of us who believe that public education is a good thing, that Jefferson, even if he was not necessarily a fan, but supported the concept was right, that Horace Mann was right, that, that, that Massachusetts was right for creating public schools, need to be very careful about the ongoing attacks on public education. Because there are lots of people out there whose goal is to completely dismantle the system, who'd like to see it replaced by some unknown privatized venture that hopefully will make money. Right now, our public schools are the indispensable institution. As weak and as frail and imperfect as they are, public schools are the one place where children will be more or less guaranteed a meal, sometimes two, adult supervision, heat, often, in the classroom, some stability of operation, adult supervision, to take that away from our kids at a time when the social safety net for poor people has completely fallen apart would be a major tragedy. The fact is that I too am an optimist, but my optimism comes from talking to kids, talking to teachers, talking to principals who haven't yet given up on this work, who continue to believe in themselves, who continue to believe that that what we're doing in education is vital for the future of this country. I think the challenge we face is to go beyond the optimism to actually challenge the country to, do, to live up to its potential. 
We can be as good as Barbados, even better than Barbados. Should, that should be our slogan. We can be as good as Barbados. <laughs> we too can educate kids to high levels because we're a great country. But it's going to take more than rhetoric. It's going to take a genuine commitment to embracing schools and providing them with the support they need to give all kids a real chance to learn. I think that the kind of schools we have in this country will determine the kind of country we live in in the future. If you are afraid about the fact that today there are more African American males in prison than in universities, if you think that's a disturbing trend, not a good way to go, if you think it's a bad idea for us to allow a sixth of all children in this country to live in poverty, to be denied access to, or to be, not have access to health care, then it's going to take people who have, those of us who are privileged, who don't have to worry about those things, to be the advocates to speak out. Because right now, those, are not, those issues are not even on the public agenda. Those are not even issues that our two gubernatorial candidates are debating right now, right? much less elsewhere because these issues have not risen to the level of importance that politicians will stake their campaigns and their promises upon them. Once that happens, I think we'll start to see the country live up to its potential. But we're away from, off from there. And it's in the hope that we will realize that potential that I wish this conference a success and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Excellent discussion. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.